you see a place that's alive with purpose and passion. You see a place inspired by a long tradition of untraditional excellence. You see a place built by the people, for the people, of California, the nation, and the world. What do you see? You see Berkeley. Good evening. I'm Dan Mogula from UC Berkeley's Office of Communications and Public Affairs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to what is for us a first, a live online question and answer session with Chancellor Nick Dirks. Nick, thanks for taking time out from what I know is a very busy schedule. It's great to be here, and I'm delighted to be part of the first webcast of this kind. I hope it's the first of many. And in fact, in the last few weeks, we have received more than a thousand questions from alumni and parents across the country and around the world. Now, based on a tally of your interests, we will tonight be talking to the Chancellor about the issues that rose to the top of your collective agenda. They include Berkeley's public character and mission, our global presence and activities, access and affordability, state support for public higher education, building a research and innovation ecosystem in and around the campus, and intercollegiate athletics. Now, if time allows, we will delve into some other subjects you have expressed interest in, but we have a heavy agenda, so without further ado, let's get started. So, Nick, the first subject we're going to talk is that really attracted the most interest was Berkeley's public character and mission. It's something that you've been talking a lot about, and many of the questions we receive from parents and alumni focused on exactly how you will maintain, be able to maintain Berkeley's excellence in the wake of fairly dramatic state budget cuts. Share for us a little bit your perspective about that mission, the ethos, and, and the challenges that we confront. Well, I think we do confront challenges, uh, but I want to begin by saying, I've said this to other groups uh, when I've talked to them about this, that when I first came here, and I spent 10 years at the University of Michigan before I went to Columbia, what struck me more, uh, I think, powerfully than anything else was the fact that the students, the staff, faculty, and alumni were deeply committed to the preservation of the public character of the institution. Now, looking at this from the outside, and I, of course, was observing Berkeley. It's one of the great institutions of higher education, and the fact that it is a public uh, uh, institution at the same time that it's been at the top of all the charts in terms of excellence, in terms of academic rankings. Uh, but looking at this from afar, I, quite frankly, was assuming uh, that it was going to have to become more and more private in order to survive. And there's been a lot of talk about that. Places like the University of Michigan and the University of Virginia, and now the University of Oregon, are making real changes in their governance structures and in the way in which they think of themselves as public institutions. But what I found when I came here was indeed a sense that whatever else we do, and we have to be inventive, we have to be nimble, we have to be flexible, and we certainly have to diversify the sources of financial support. The financial model, of course, has to change. But whatever we do, we have to maintain our public ethos. Now, what does, what does that mean? Well, it means, among other things, ensuring that whenever we are mounting a new research effort, whenever we're thinking about uh, the questions of access and affordability with respect to our students, uh, whenever we think about the purposes of education, we make sure that we maintain a sense of the public good. Now, education is a private good in the sense Students get a lot out of it for themselves. Uh, research often is something that is deeply fulfilling to the researchers, whether they're graduate students or postdocs or faculty who are engaged in it. But it's also at Berkeley always something else, always something more, always something greater. And that sense of wanting to, to use the phrase that I hear more than any other one here, change the world is something I think that is going to be uh, so hardwired uh, in the future that it's just never going to go away. That being said, uh, we do have challenges. Uh, when Chancellor Bergeno began uh, his, uh, his time here in 2004, 30% of the university's budget came from the state. When I began in June of 2013, only 12% of our budget came from the state. That's a dramatic change. 
And even now, with increased uh, allocations from the state, increase uh, this year of 5%, we're still talking about a base that is vastly different than the base we had before. So how are we going to maneuver that? My sense is that we maneuver it through uh, the same kind of inventiveness that this campus has, uh, has displayed over the course of its long history now, almost 150 years. And we find ways to recruit more and more support from more and more uh, alumni, from more and more firms and corporations and uh, private enterprises, but always with the sense that the partnership here is a public pro partnership. Yeah. And we then take whatever the kind of ideas are, whatever the kind of opportunities are, whatever the kind of educational mission uh, that we undertake to a public uh, uh, to, to, to measure it in relationship to, to a set of public metrics as well as all the other metrics that are talked about. You know, it was interesting, in your inauguration speech, you sort of uh, described in detail the three pillars of your agenda, your aspirations for the campus. And they were un undergraduate education, leaning in to try to improve the undergraduate right. experience here, research and innovation, and Ber Berkeley's global footprint. How do you see each of those expanding or supplementing or embellishing that public ethos and mission you've been talking about? Right, absolutely. Well, first let me start with the undergraduate education pillar because that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, this has always been a great uh, institution for undergraduates. And whenever I talk to alums about their experience here, those who were here as undergraduates, I hear you know, a kind of sense that this was the place that uh, changed their lives. It was the inflection point. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and many alums will tell me that the kinds of things that they've gone on to do in their lives are, in some sense, fundamentally rooted in the experience they had here at Cal. So that's there. And uh, nothing I do, no initiative I announce, no pillar that I try to erect uh, my administration on is going to change that. On the other hand, I think you could say that uh, we have often been uh, preoccupied in this institution, and for very good reason, with the extraordinary character of the research that we do, with the very high rankings of our graduate programs, and we haven't paid enough attention across the institution to the experience of our undergraduates, to ensure that when they come here, they don't fall through cracks, they don't uh, have to uh, 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 waste precious time and we know that the time that is spent and the money that is spent uh, along with it uh, to secure an education now is uh, more precious than ever. But we want to make sure that uh, they come here and they hit the ground running, that they are able to use this education uh, all the way through their four years here or two years if they come in as transfer students, uh, and that they go away with a sense that they've really been able to use the opportunities that were available here in the most coherent of ways for them, carrying with them both a sense of the general kinds of issues that we provide as a liberal arts institution on the one hand, and also the very specific, concrete, and usually cutting edge uh, kinds of specializations that are part of our educational programs. But undergraduates make up the bulk of our alumni. Mm -hmm. Our public, in terms of uh, uh, outreach, in terms of uh, students coming in, alumni going out, is dominated really by our undergraduates. So if you don't have the most, uh, 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 I think, the, the most uh, uh, comprehensive uh, forms of attention paid to the undergraduate experience, you're not actually dealing with the first and foremost part of our public operation. So undergraduate education, public education, these are things that are aligned, always have been, but I think we can do better. The same is true in many respects for the other two pillars that I've announced. Uh, but in those respects, I think uh, uh, one could even say more about the public character of what I have in mind. With respect to innovation, this has always been a campus that has uh, engaged in the highest levels of research and has generated uh, discoveries and um, uh, new insights and uh, new ways of uh, not only looking at the world but of creating uh, products from uh, you know, from the polio vaccine to new elements to, you know, the list is just uh, dizzying when yeah. you go through it. Uh, the Nobel Prize winners, the others who have uh, earned great uh, academic distinction uh, make, that, make that very clear. But what we need to make sure we are able to do at a time when there's so much emphasis on using innovation for 
uh, new kinds of technology or new kinds of apps that will make the world more uh, usable for us as individuals. We have to make sure we are doing more than that, uh, that we're not just uh, developing, although it's great to do that, uh, a new app for getting a taxi in San Francisco. I'm from New York, I believe in getting taxis and I've had a little bit of trouble doing that. But at the same time, what we need to do here is ensure that all of the innovation we do is going to create goods, products, perspectives on the world that is going to actually make it a better world. We see, uh, uh, we see examples of that all over the place, and I can perhaps go on and talk yeah, about talk a few more. Yeah, we're going to talk more about the global. Yeah. Actually, it's our next subject. Well, the global is the third the, one, yeah. 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 Um, you know, in, in fact, the uh, very close second to public mission w in terms of interest from all of you who have written in to us was the topic of Berkeley's global presence. Uh, we had, in fact, 278 questions. Um, Lisa Wang weighed in, Lisa Maurer weighed in, David Roach. I mean, these are just some of the names that mm -hmm. you know, I'm seeing up here on the screen, a number of people. Really, and, I, and that was a little bit surprising to me. And I think it was surprising to a lot of people on campus that you've put that on the front burner. Talk to us a little bit about why, about why expanding Berkeley's global presence and activities is something that you see as important and how it connects to what we were just talking about, right. the public mission. Well, first of all, I have to confess, uh, I come here with a background uh, in Asian studies. I've spent a lot of my life both doing scholarship in and staying and, 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 and living for long periods of time in India, uh, also in Europe. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, I've come to see the world as a much more connected place, perhaps, uh, than uh, might have otherwise been the case a long time back. That being said, I think everyone understands now how interconnected we are. The age of globalization is an age in which we know a change in terms of financial markets in Hong Kong can affect us right here in California within a matter of minutes. Uh, we know in terms of climate change, in terms of pollution, in terms of world political and uh, cultural and social unrest, uh, that these, these issues are no longer just about foreign affairs and, uh, and following uh, events in, in, in places that won't touch us. Uh, they touch us deeply. They touch us uh, immediately. Uh, and, and so, uh, so I've, I, I brought my own sense of uh, connectedness to, to Asia to think through how the university can become uh, a more, uh, uh, well, develop a greater global footprint uh, and uh, prepare our students to live in this new global world uh, more uh, aggressively, perhaps, than we've done in the past. Almost all of our students are going to have experiences in their lives, whether they travel or not, that are going to require a certain kind of global literacy, mm -hmm. really. And uh, of course, if they can travel while they're here, whether as uh, study abroad students or interns or uh, even for shorter kinds of experiences abroad, it opens up doors. It opens up a way of looking at the world. And it produces the kind of basis on which they will be global citizens going forward, as indeed they will need to be. The same is true with our faculty. Now, I learned just this morning that 40% of our junior faculty are international in background. Wow. So if you're looking for talent, yeah. it's a global marketplace. It's no longer just the question of putting an ad out in the Chronicle of Higher Education mm -hmm. and expecting you get applicants from the 50 states. Especially in the sciences and engineering, the talent is all over the world. So we're bringing people in from outside, we can use their experiences, their backgrounds, their networks, their connections, and of course their great talent and expertise to open up, again, a more global context in which to think about uh, how we operate as a university. We of course have increasing numbers of students also coming from places outside the US. Uh, but, the, uh, but the point here is to try to concentrate and focus on what it might mean to be a global university. It's not that we aren't a global university. We've actually been a global university for a long time. But I think we need to really take on board and, 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 and consider uh, carefully what it might mean for all of our students to have a better sense of what it means to enter into this new age of globalization. You know, I hear you talk, wh when I listen to you talk about this, it sounds like you're also in the course of that focus on the global presence really in the process of expanding the conceptualization of what is a public university in the 21st century. I mean, you know, you mentioned climate change and a lot of these problems we face as a globe, no, no national boundaries, no, no academic borders. Um, you know, when I first started working here 10 years ago, I thought of it as a Cal California's public university. 
But you seem to be suggesting in terms of, also in terms of research, that we need to expand the way we think of the public good and the role we play. Do I have that right? And talk to us a little bit about that. That's right. No, I think that, uh, you know, when you look back at the history of public institutions in this country, the Morrill Act of 1862 mm -hmm. and the emergence of these great state universities across the country, especially, of course, in the Midwest and the West, you look at uh, universities that in the first instance saw themselves as relating to their particular states. They took students from those states and they uh, had a mission to educate them mm -hmm. and to ensure that those states had a really vital uh, and accessible system of public uh, higher education. That continues to be the case. That will continue to be the case. But even in the early days, these universities, places like Berkeley, drew students in from uh, places abroad and taught about places ab abroad. The first endowed chair here at Columbia was the Louis Agassiz Chair in Chinese Studies. Mm -hmm. And we have a long tradition of, uh, of, 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 of teaching and doing research on and uh, about China. Uh, but now, I think increasingly, we have come to understand that we can no longer think about the public just in terms of our local community, just mm -hmm. in terms even of our state, as vast as California is, mm -hmm. as uh, much of a kind of almost independent ecosystem as this state is. And, uh, and I'm thrilled to be back in California, by the way. But that being said, as you put it, the, na the state borders, national borders, no longer allow you really to think through what and how we address some of the major challenges that are confronting us today. And, you know, again, this is one of the leading centers of research on climate change, as well as on issues around sustainability, on issues around new forms of energy. These are global issues, and they're going to require global solutions. And they will benefit us here in California, here in the Bay Area, but they are part of a global network more than ever before. We just have a little bit of time in this section left, but I did want to ask, so what do you mean by expanding Berkeley's global presence? Are we talking about satellite campuses? What specifically is, it, is on offer here? You know, one of the great things about Berkeley having not really thought through very much uh, the question of its global presence is that we can learn from the mistakes of previous, of, of, of previous experiments and uh, the universities that have already engaged in this. Uh, NYU famously has set up campuses in Abu Dhabi and now in Shanghai. Uh, Yale is in the, pro in the process of setting up a campus in Singapore. All of those have occasioned considerable controversy on campus, and they have all, I think, raised questions about how you uh, actually can focus on, uh, uh, you know, the questions that are part of building a campus, building a faculty, recruiting students, paying the same kind of attention to, uh, to faculty and students and the educational process uh, in places thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. And they haven't always worked. They haven't always worked in part because people want to come here or they want to go to New York or they right. want to come to the campus. They want to spend time, uh, uh, residential time on the campus where they're, uh, uh, where they're attending. And, um, and, 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 the, and the branch campuses often become like franchises, but without any real organic set of relationships with and connections to the home campus. Right. So what do you think we can do? Yeah. We can do, we can actually uh, take advantage of a model that I've been involved in uh, at Columbia, mm. setting up what we uh, might call consular offices. They can be small, they can be set up, and if they don't work, they can be closed down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is nimble. very little, very, very nimble, very much uh, in the way of, uh, of, of setting up the basis for certain kinds of activities. And if they work, uh, they, can be, uh, they can be built out and, uh, and they can grow. Uh, but what they will allow uh, are all sorts of things. They'll allow us to connect better with our alumni on a global basis. They'll allow us to uh, find opportunities for our faculty to engage in collaborative research with scholars and uh, researchers across the world. And they will allow us to develop more opportunities for our students in particular to engage not only in st study abroad uh, programs, but to do internships abroad. Great, so we're already moving on to the next subject. <laughs> we're just whipping through them here, but really folks had very dis a diverse set of interests, no surprise, yeah. they're Berkeley alumni and parents. And no surprise that the next issue, which was number three, it had 261 separate questions on the issue of access and affordability. Mm -hmm. We got questions about that from Pam Stello and Carol Love and Laura Terry and Dana and Claudia and obviously hundreds of others. Um, and, you know, on the face of it, it would seem to be simply a matter of advocating for continued freeze on tuition increases. You know, you keep the price down, you, you maintain access and affordability. But is there more people should be aware of 
when they think about access and affordability, and how do you think we should be approaching the issue of tuition and financial aid in the years ahead? Right. Well, you know, many people, particularly alums who went here 20, 30, even 40 years ago, remember the days when they could come here for almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, even our governor, Jerry Brown, every time I talk with him, talks about the fact he came here for $75 a, uh, a quarter. Uh, and of course, the idea that um, education can be free, uh, and indeed was free in the great state of California, uh, especially in the years after the master plan, is a great idea. And it's an idea I would love to return to. Unfortunately, of course, uh, it's based on a fundamental uh, premise, which is that if it's not being paid for through tuition, it's being paid for through state allocations. We're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the days, of course, uh, the days when it was uh, that inexpensive to come here that 70, 75 percent of the budget actually came from the state. So, you know, we're in a different world. We do have to charge a higher level of tuition. One of the things that I found, though, quite amazing about this, 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 this institution uh, is that uh, there is a deep commitment to maintaining the sense of access and affordability that's been there you know, since, since the beginning. A sense that even if it's not entirely free, you should be able to come here irrespective of your financial situation. So, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Berkeley has been very aggressive in recruiting students from a large number of different kinds of socioeconomic, cultural, ethnic, racial backgrounds. Mm -hmm. It has been uh, uniquely successful, I think, in recruiting students who, by the standards of Pell Grant uh, awards, means they come from families making less than $45,000 a year. In fact, we have about 37% of our undergraduates here being supported by Pell Grants. Wow. This is an extraordinary number. And by the way, I'll just add, if I might, uh, the fact that I'm in going, going in the morning to the White House uh, for a conference of university presidents and chancellors uh, to talk with the president and various people in the White House about uh, both questions of affordability and access on the one side and how we can do a better job of recruiting uh, students from backgrounds where college doesn't even seem like a possibility. But when I first was talking to Gene Sperling in the White House about this effort that they're engaged in right now, this is back in October, uh, he said, you know, we want to push places like Berkeley to take up to 20% Pell Grant students. And I said, you know, we're closing in on 40%. And he was astonished. He didn't actually know it. Yeah. But the work that has been done here to, uh, to recruit and then help to support these students, and they're not just supported by Pell Grants, they're also supported by Cal Grants, they're supported by uh, by efforts to return tuition that comes in to students who need it most. Now that's for students uh, coming from families that uh, make less than 45,000. Last year, uh, my predecessor introduced the middle class access program to uh, uh, provide uh, financial aid for students coming from families making up to 140,000, I think. And this is an effort to cap the amount uh, of, uh, uh, of tuition and fees paid by families uh, to 15 percent of their family income. This is an extraordinary effort to, uh, to, to make sure that the groups that are being most squeezed in some ways by the rising cost of tuition, the middle class, uh, also have the benefit of support. So the bottom line here is that uh, education is expensive. It is expensive. I mean, we could replace it with a set of online MOOCs, mass open online courses. We could uh, you know, we could compromise the kind of education we, could, we, we provide, the kind of research we do, the kind of outreach that's part of our public service, uh, and make it cheaper. But we would be losing the essence of what we do here. So we do need to have a certain level of, uh, of tuition that helps support uh, uh, the institution as a whole. Uh, but we have to make sure that financial aid is absolutely central to how we think about even the levels of tuition we charge. Right now, in-state tuition is still, without the fees, under $13,000. And 40% of our students pay no tuition at all. So that does mean that the burden gets shared, gets shared by all sorts of uh, uh, things, including tuition paid by those who can afford it. Uh, but we need to keep tuition low. Uh, at the same time, we need to understand that tuition itself is a lever that we can use to provide financial aid 
for students who need it. So how are you going to how are you going to achieve this? So you know I think we have a substantial record, and I'm sure that's a it's you know it's a bit of a challenge. You're coming into a, in, uh, an institution that obviously has done a really good job in terms of the socioeconomic diversity of the campus. The financial situation of the campus and the state is changing. It's improving. Um, going forward, how are you going to sustain that record that we've built up over the years? Well, first of all, I'm not giving up on the state. I've been spending a lot of time in Sacramento. I've been talking with Speaker Perez and the head of the Budget Committee and the State Assembly, Nancy Skinner, who's a local representative. I've mm -hmm. been talking with the governor. I've been working with the president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano, who comes with a great track record in terms of her political skill and savvy. Uh, going to Washington tomorrow, again, to advocate for increased uh, uh, funding for Pell Grants and for other kinds of support for universities like ours. Uh, so I'm not giving up on the fact that we still need to claim that when we say we are providing a public good, we have some public funding that goes along with that. On the other hand, there are lots of other things we're doing. Uh, we've recently closed a brilliant campaign that was formally launched in a fundraising the, campaign, a fundraising campaign uh, that was formally launched the same week that Lehman Brothers fell <laughs> in the fall of 2008. Eight, and it was a big fall. Timing is everything. Yeah. Uh, and this campus was amazing because it launched this campaign really at a time that everyone thought, what are we doing? This is, uh, this is I mean, talk about writing failure into a, into a script. <laughs> uh, but lo and behold, a $3 billion campaign was successfully completed uh, within, uh, uh, before the end of 2013. Now, of course, what are we doing? We're going to launch another campaign. Uh, we need to find ways to build our sources of mm. support, of philanthropy, uh, and this means uh, a, a wide range of things. On the one hand, it means turning to people who have great means and can help uh, support at very high levels some of the kinds of uh, 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 big ideas that are, that, are, that are germinating constantly on campus, but it also means asking everyone to pitch in, to help us however it works for them uh, to make it possible for us to sustain our excellence. So you gave me a great segue because, in fact, the next subject in terms of popularity was indeed state support for higher education. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, <laughs> number of people wrote in about that. There was a lot of concern. I think there was some. I think when I read through the questions, there was some anxiety, but there was also some curiosity. So we're down to twelve percent in terms of you know our operate our operating mm -hmm. budget. What state funding accounts for twelve percent? How important is it really? Um, in the big scheme of things, and is it worth the strings that come attached? Um, do you see any chance that we'll ever return to the sort of the golden era of Jerry Brown's $75 a year tuition? So how do you see the state right now? Talk about a little yeah, bit about that. No, these, are, these are great questions because uh, they really come to the heart of the matter, how one can uh, make the kinds of trade-offs necessary to sustain both the excellence and the kind of public mission that is so uh, deeply embedded in, in this institution. One of the great things about state support is that it's unrestricted. It may come with strings attached, but in fact it goes into our base budget. And one of the problems that you have with fundraising is it's very hard, in fact, to raise money for just business as usual, for the salaries of staff and faculty, uh, for the maintenance of buildings, for just you know the base parts of our budget. So. There are uh, regulations attached to all of this. There uh, certainly uh, are frustrations in, in some of the ways in which we're connected both to a, a state system and, and a state. But, but, but state support uh, actually is, is incredibly important. Uh, and it almost, uh, uh, it's, it's best illustrated by noting that, you know, I came from an Ivy League university. I came from Columbia. Uh, Columbia uh, uh, built up an endowment to the point where when I left, it was just under $8 billion. If you think about a 5% payout of an endowment, mm. that's what uh, uh, helps make the difference when you don't have state support. But the kind of state support we get, even though it's much less than it was in previous years, still represents a significant, uh, uh, is, is more or less the same of what a, a, a significant endowment would be. So until we can build an endowment, we're really not in a place where we could say we could do without it. But we'd have to build a very big endowment, in fact, to do that. 
So what's the case you're making in Sacramento? Because I could imagine legislators saying to you, well, you know, Chancellor Dirks, you know, we did cut back support, cut back support, it's true, but you, rose, you raised tuition, but your students are still graduating with very low levels of debt. Correct. I think the average Cal, only 40% of our students graduate with debt, and of those who do, I think the average debt load is $16,000, well below the national average. That's right. What do you say to them? I mean, because they can point and say, what's the big problem here? You know, it seems to be fine with these higher level of tuitions. We've got other needs we need to take care of in the state. Why you? Well, first of all, let me uh, be clear. Uh, we haven't been allowed to raise tuition now for two years, and uh, the current budget has been released with a provision, at least on the part of the governor and so far, uh, that we hold tuition constant uh, for the next few years as well. Uh, so yes, there were increases in tuition over the last uh, few years that were dramatic, uh, and no one uh, should uh, you know, uh, deny that. Uh, but, um, uh, but what's interesting, if you go back and you look at the history of tuition increases in the institution and across the University of California, if we had had regular, predictable, and moderate tuition increases of say four, five, even six percent a year, over the course of the last 20 years, we would actually have a lower tuition level mm -hmm. at this point, but we would have escaped some of the uh, uh, financial stress uh, that we had during bad years. It turns out we, we raise tuition in bad times mm -hmm. when people can least afford it, and we hold tuition constant in good times when the wherewithal to pay for it is, in fact, slightly better. Now, that makes sense, but it's actually counterintuitive. And as I was saying before when we were talking, tuition does make all sorts of things possible. It does pay necessary bills, and it does allow us to provide financial aid to ensure that the financial situation of any family uh, will not get in the way of their kids attending Cal. So is that the case you're making? Is that one of the prime things, to try to see if we can come to some sort of new tuition platform that would be predictable and constant without those wild swings and dips, is, is that the center of the case you're taking up Highway 80? Yeah, there are different ways to do that, but I think that uh, uh, something that would be predictable, that would be known when you actually begin the whole process of paying for a, a, a university education, uh, would be much better than the kind of uncertainty that's attached to the current system of setting tuition, holding it constant, and then realizing since, since you're holding it constant with expenses going up all the time, that at some point you have to take the uh, the cap off and 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 raise uh, the levels at a much higher uh, at a much higher level than is uh, than is really doable on the part of most families. So that would be a case that I would make. But again, tuition only pays for a small fraction of all the things that go on on campus. And mm -hmm. so when we go to the state, uh, we're constantly making uh, the case that tuition only represents a, a a particular part of our budget to support the kind of research that we do. This requires state funding. Scientific research is incredibly expensive. In fields like chemistry now, when you hire a cutting edge chemist, even at the most junior levels of their career, you often have to come up with a startup package of three, four million dollars to get them to the point where they can do the kind of scientific research that will continue to develop new products. It's absolutely critical that we can maintain our competitive edge with respect to uh, other institutions and indeed with private institutions uh, who have been spending a lot of money to try to uh, uh, first uh, get up to the level of Berkeley, and then to steal our faculty and uh, take our students and uh, steal our thunder. Uh -huh. But under your watch, that's not going to happen, right? No thunder is going to be <laughs> handed over to any of the privates, absolutely. We got it all here, we'll keep it. So we're going to move on to the next subject now. The next subject, um, as per the tally of the votes and the questions that we received, uh, is building a research and innovation ecosystem in and around the campus. Um, now, I think as everyone knows, here, and as you well know, uh, Berkeley's already a renowned research institution, long legacy of breakthroughs. So where do you see the opportunity and the need in, in terms of expanding those efforts? And how does the Richmond Bay campus play into all this? And I should just say before, before you mm -hmm. start, so for people who may not be aware, you know, the campus is, is planning and thinking and considering for the long term about really expanding into Richmond. Um, so we have property there that's been underutilized. We have space needs here on the core campus that aren't being met and a lot of aspirations in terms of research. So talk to us a little bit about where else can we go for such a, you know, a great a place that's made, has such a fabulous reputation in terms of research and how Richmond fits in with all that. Right. Well, you know, to be innovative often requires uh, space. 
And usually the biggest problem we have in terms of actually allowing big ideas to take off, whether we have funding from the outside or we're allocating resources from inside, is where are we going to uh, create the spaces where this can happen? So the fact that we have the Richmond Bay Field Station and the fact that we have this uh, extraordinary expanse of land right on the bay, uh, 10 miles away, uh, is a huge uh, uh, boon uh, to thinking about the future of, of, of research uh, on this campus. And it is uh, going to be an extension, really, of the Berkeley campus. So it also is a place where we can develop new kinds of partnerships. Mm. And uh, we've already had inquiries from a number of uh, firms in the Silicon Valley and elsewhere uh, about setting up uh, a small startup of one sort or another, building on some of the research that's been, doing, that's been done here, uh, and finding new ways to advance research. Right at the moment, we have uh, on this campus, just to give you an example, something called the Shake Table. This has been set up by the College of Engineering, and it's a, uh, a, an elaborate uh, uh, platform uh, that simulates earthquakes at different seismic levels. And so you can test on this shake table things like, for example, as was done last year, the bolts uh, on the new Bay Bridge to see whether or not they'll hold. Now, I take the Bay Bridge often enough <laughs> that I'm deeply committed to research of this kind. But the truth is that I think the opportunities for uh, new kinds of innovation on the basis of things that are going on here are just almost endless. For example, one of the fields that we are uh, really uh, at the forefront of is nanotechnology. Now, nano just means very small. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not, not a bad scientist. For a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what is going on in the microfabrication labs that we have here? Uh, is the creation of new materials, things like graphene, for example, mm -hmm. which if you look at them from the side, you can barely see. They're so, uh, they're just, you know, so thin, uh, but which have uh, uh, the, the, the kind of strength that will allow them to be the foundation for building new buildings, skyscrapers and mm -hmm. other kinds of structures that will bear much more weight than standard steel and uh, the usual kinds of uh, materials that are today used for, for building. Uh, but we are able to uh, develop these technologies here. Uh, and the other thing to say about them is not only will they be uh, better materials, uh, they'll be cheaper, they will uh, consume less energy, they will allow us uh, to develop new forms of green, uh, green building that will be good for our environment. And this is work that we're doing here, but we'll need space for, uh, for doing that. Richmond will be a great, a great, a great opportunity to, uh, uh, to put spaces for that kind of research. So when, you, when I hear you talk about ecosystem, it also s seems as if you're talking about speeding that translation of research breakthroughs into beneficial goods and services for the public. Is that too part of sort of a reimagining of the public mission or an expansion? How do you see that? Yeah, no, it's an interesting balance uh, because I think that we uh, at Berkeley are all concerned uh, that in developing these kinds of private-public partnerships, we maintain a clear focus on, on what we're doing. Uh, and that focus, of course, is on creating uh, new ideas, new ways of, uh, of, of, of imagining uh, the world and then of creating the physical infrastructure of that world that will address these, these major challenges that we have before us. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, that, that as we demonstrate uh, the importance, the significance, and indeed the usability of the things that we're producing here in our, in our laboratories and in our on our computers and in our, in our design spaces, uh, we can find new ways to reimagine what it means to change the world, to create uh, the public good out of the work that we do, uh, and indeed to address the public uh, in incredibly meaningful ways. As long as we keep that balance centered on our idea of what it means to be a public institution with a public mission. So we're, we're almost out of time for this section, but I do want to follow up on one quick thing because it's something that struck me. So when, when, you, when you got here, you talked a lot about, and you've talked this evening about that emphasis, that focus on undergraduate education. For a long time, it seems that it's been thought that there's an inherent tension between research and undergraduate education. Can we have that all? Can we focus on both things at the same time without diminishing the value and the quality of what we do in both of those areas here? Yeah, no, no, it's a great question. And in fact, it's a question that I think has uh, dominated the landscape of higher education in America for years. You know, you, every decade you hear a new set of debates around teaching, research, 
They can't be done at the same time. If you do one, you can't do the other. If you're doing the other, uh, you're compromising your capacity to do, uh, 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 to do uh, uh, both at the same time. Uh, I am adamant uh, that we can do, do both together, but I'm also convinced that the two complement each other. Mm. First of all, when we teach in a research university, we teach students how to do research. Mm -hmm. And we teach them partly by, in the first instance, showing them how research creates new ideas and new understandings of the world, and we teach those new understandings. But then we give them opportunities to do research themselves. They participate in labs. They go off and they engage in different kinds of projects. They even engage in community service that allows them in some kinds of majors, for example, to really test out the ideas that they talk about in classrooms in the real world. And through those experiences, which are research experiences, and I think you can do research even in the arts. That's uh, a, a field of material uh, creation that, again, is experimented with by doing uh, and by, uh, by trying, trying out new ways of shaping perception of the world. Uh, by doing all of these things, we show that research is what teaching is all about. And all of our students graduate from this institution with a real sense that they can do research. Now, this may be, in some respects, the most important thing we teach. But we can only teach it if there's research going on. By the same token, I think our public mission cannot be uh, properly enacted uh, without the extraordinary excellence and uh, vitality and you know, range of research uh, activities that are going on on campus. So last but not least, we've come to the sort of the last subject that was one of the top vote getters and uh, no surprise that it's intercollegiate athletics. Um, I want to ask you a question about, you know, a subject, an unfortunate subject that's made the news lately and that's uh, the graduation rate of the Cal football team and the basketball team for that matter. But before we go into that side of it, talk to us a little bit about how you see the role, what, the benefits of a robust intercollegiate athletics program at a university like UC Berkeley. Well, I come here with the sense that this is a great university and everything it does should be great. Uh, I also come with the sense that athletics plays a vital role in American higher education. So I am thrilled when I read, for example, that uh, the Olympic sports at Berkeley have produced in the last Olympics the seventh largest number, if you took Berkeley to be a country, of gold medalists anywhere in the world right here from the Berkeley campus. Mm -hmm. Do I have the statistic right? It's extraordinary to me. And that just gives me a sense of, uh, of great pride. We just need to manage your expectations for the Winter Olympics. We don't do so well there, but anyway. Well, we also need some snow in the uh, <laughs> yeah, Sierra, right. but we'll, uh, we'll take that when it, when it comes. But, um, but by the same token, sports like football, basketball, which of course are the ones that are primarily at issue when talking about issues uh, having to do with graduation rates and uh, maintaining that healthy relationship between the student and the athlete, athlete uh, are, again, uh, huge foci of uh, student, faculty, staff, and alumni uh, spirit. Uh, there's a real sense when you go to Memorial Stadium that, uh, you know, there's this kind of, uh, I'm sorry to do this, I'm going to use an anthropological term from Emil Durkheim, there's a kind of collective effervescence that you feel when you go into Memorial Stadium. And you know, the wonderful thing, every third uh, period I've gone over to the student section, I've sat there and I've realized that the students are sometimes not even paying attention to the game at all. <laughs> but the game has to be there for them to be there. And they just have such extraordinary spirit that they display. So you know, again, there are lots of different parts to how uh, intercollegiate athletics works on a campus like this. But I think that if you're going to have uh, an athletics program, and I believe we should, we have to try to make it the best program possible. But, and I know this is the second part of the question, uh, but we cannot lose sight. Uh, we simply cannot give up on the idea that we shouldn't be able to have our cake and eat it too here too. Uh, we need to be able to ensure that our student athletes graduate at the same rates that other students do. We have to make sure uh, that they are given the kind of support they need. And sometimes the drill of being a football player is very intensive. And it does put huge demands on, uh, on, on, our, on our students. Or any student athlete for that matter. All, all of our student athletes have to negotiate uh, you know, incredibly difficult practice 
uh, periods and hours in terms of trying to balance their, their studies and their, and their athletic pursuits. But we have to make it possible for them to succeed. That's right. So this morning, in fact, 8.30 this morning, I convened the first meeting of the task force on uh, academics and athletics at, uh, at Cal. And I delivered my charge to the committee. And I said, we have to find out whatever it will take, what the sources of difficulty have been over the last, uh, over the last years. Uh, and we had, even in the short time that I was part of this uh, committee meeting, some very frank exchanges mm -hmm. about some of the issues that confront us. They're not going to be easy. Yeah. Welcome and to Cal. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely critical that a task force like this know that there's no um, forbidden ground. They have mm -hmm. to be able to look at questions around the culture of, mm -hmm. of, of athletics on campus. They have to look at, you know, how student athletes feel. They have to think about the problem that was even raised this morning in terms of the stereotypes about athletes on the, on the Cal campus. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for success uh, in, this, in this domain, we actually have to recruit participation from students, from staff, both within the athletic department and outside, from faculty, and from alumni uh, to help us uh, work through these issues and, and, and find a way to make, to make it work. Well, Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Um, I had a lot more questions, and I know folks who sent in questions, you know, that weren't answered or might be a little bit frustrated, but um, the conversation was fantastic. I, I hope we're going to be able to do this again sometime. And on behalf of all of us here at Cal, I really want to thank all of you out there for joining us this evening and for the excellent questions and suggestions you submitted. Again, I just wish we had time to cover them all. But hopefully we will have that opportunity to rejoin you again in the same fashion sometime down the road. And on your behalf, allow me to thank Nick for your time, your candor, and your commitment to this campus. Uh, it was a great conversation, um, and I think people have gotten just a taste of what all of us who work here have been experiencing uh, with the leadership that you're providing and the ambitions that you have for this great university and the continuation of its public mission. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you all for having taken the time out this evening to join us in this conversation. I only wish I could see you all. That's the frustration <laughs> here. But I think that uh, this format allows me to engage with a wide number of you around issues that you care deeply about. And uh, listening to your questions and trying to uh, engage them with the seriousness they deserve uh, reminds me, I think, of the incredible role that alumni play and your sense of commitment uh, to and loyalty with respect to this, uh, this, this great institution. There are lots of difficult challenges ahead, but I know with your help, with your support, with your continued participation and engagement in conversations like this, and we hope that this will be the first of many, uh, we will prevail. It is fabulous to be here. I've had a wonderful welcome from you all. And go Bears! Go Bears. Thanks.